Hello and a very warm welcome. Uh, thank you very much indeed for joining us for this very special live web broadcast to launch the Dates in Destiny uh, new white paper that's uh, been, uh, which will be released uh, tomorrow. You're getting the first sight of it uh, today. Now, um, what are Dates with Destiny? Uh, well, many of you are well aware of Alibaba's 1111 shopping festival. But what you might not be aware of is that there are many, many more shopping festivals uh, in China uh, today than uh, just 1111. And uh, the um, paper that we are releasing today in collaboration with Alibaba, and with thanks to Alibaba for a lot of their support um, in uh, gaining a lot of the insights for it, um, is aimed at really helping you to understand how you can indeed understand uh, China shopping festivals and use that as a way uh, to uh, grow your business. Well, we've got three key guests today as well as uh, a lot of uh, uh, observations uh, from uh, the report. Uh, the report itself is uh, um, quite extensive. We're not going to go through all of that uh, today, you'll be glad to know. But at the end of the broadcast, what I'll be doing is uh, uh, giving you a URL where you can uh, download the report today in advance of anybody else being able to see it. Well, I'm very, very glad that uh, my first guest um, is um, Christina, uh, the head of fashion and uh, uh, luxury for Alibaba. Um, a very, very warm welcome. Thank you very much indeed for joining us all the way from uh, the States. I know it's early in the morning for you. It's super great to be here. You know, it's really nice to see the fantastic job you did with the report, getting all of our information nicely packaged together. Well, um, I think uh, the first area that I'd very much like to explore with you is this whole sort of notion of uh, uh, the luxury brands have sort of stood on the sidelines, both in terms of getting involved in some of the shopping festivals, but also uh, in terms of digital. Um, why do you think that is? And why are they now, uh, rather than standing on the sidelines, jumping in at the deep end with both feet? Um, I think, first of all, for the festivals, you know, the luxury brands have always participated. They've always made uh, special collections for Christmas, for Valentine's Day. And so this part, the product part, was already ready. You're right on the digital. And having worked for a long time in digital and luxury brands, one of the things that comes to mind is digital is quick and scrappy. We put things online. If we don't like them, we take them down, we change them, we iterate, and it's fast and dirty. Luxury is the opposite of that. When we create something for our luxury brand, it takes a long time to make a perfect package of something beautiful and wonderful. So I think it took a while for both the digital player side, so our side, and the luxury side to learn how to work together to really create something spectacular for the brands online. So on one side, everything has matured, both the luxury brands and our platforms. On the other side, there's the consumer aspect. Consumers now of the luxury brands, specifically when we speak about China, are much, much younger. So they are digital first and on their mobile phones all the time, every day. So if the luxury brands want to reach their future consumer, they need to learn how to go digital. And this year, I have to say that we've seen really exciting things coming from the brands for all of our festivals. So it's been a very exciting time. Now, um, what type of sort of uh, 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 content are luxury brands creating uh, for the various different festivals? Because, of course, luxury brands have been uh, very tight on the content that they uh, create and the way in which dis it's distributed. Clearly, that's being democratized in a large way. So what is it that they're creating for these? Uh, I think it's really fun to see. Obviously, you know that in China, for us, and specifically also for the shopping festivals, uh, this year, live streaming has been super important. Because people don't have such an opportunity to interact face-to-face, -face, although in China now they're getting back to normal, being able to engage people through live streaming has been very important. And maybe when we think of live streaming, we think of something of, you know, somebody standing on the street and kind of live streaming from their vegetable cart. Uh, obviously, for the luxury brands, it's been completely different. So we've created 
uh, and we've had brands like Cartier, Valentino, uh, Zegna do really beautiful um, live streams where the sets that they're live streaming from, the presenters that they're using, and of course the products that they're giving to us are very, very different. So we see them taking a technology that has, as you say, been, uh, you know, made widely available and really tailoring it to the luxury segment. And for luxury, this is very, very important because one of the things that sets luxury brands apart and luxury products apart is their heritage, the craftsmanship, um, how their products are made, the materials. So these kind of digital technologies actually give them the opportunity to really explain about their product and teach people about why their products are different. A lot of our Chinese consumers are still in a discovery phase. So having this kind of information and having more access to that information is super important. Now, um, we've seen more and more that live streaming is playing a very important role uh, in the way in which uh, communication is taking place, um, both for the shopping festivals and frankly for everything in China. Um, what are luxury brands doing in the live streaming space? Are they actively involved? Because in live streaming, in its very essence, um, is pretty scrappy. Um, luxury brands at its core is perfection. How do those two things combine? Um, well, already this year, before we talked about uh, what's happening in China, we had to worry about things like how are, how are luxury brands going to do fashion shows this year when we can't have people sitting in the audience? So there has been an industry-wide upgrade about how we can tell our stories through live streaming. So they've taken all of the best of those technologies and used it for their storytelling. And they adapt that storytelling every time we have one of our festivals, right? So we're getting ready for Chinese New Year, and we'll see 130 brands from the Luxury Pavilion join us um, and do the um, live streaming with their products directly on, you know, during the, the live during. Chinese New Year. Now, um, you sit in a very sort of privileged position in a sense, looking across what every, everybody uh, in luxury um, uh, uh, is doing across the platform. Um, we have a special feature in the report that looks at uh, in depth what's going on in the luxury space. Um, but uh, for those people watching who are not in the luxury space, what learnings um, can they apply that the luxury players are, are playing? Um, at the moment that they could apply for their businesses? What I think is really the most important thing, um, we create tools, for example, a live streaming tool or different promotions that we have on our platform that are all tailored to allow brands to communicate directly with consumers in China. So luxury brands have taken what we've created and they adapt it to their world, their consumers, and their markets. But every single brand can do this. Every single brand has their own DNA, their own tone of voice, um, their own communication. Even among the luxury brands, they have very different communication styles. So we've seen a lot of different activities and activations for the single brands between the kind of KOLs that they're using. For example, some people will use very famous KOLs like a Kim Kardashian or the very big following in an international uh, sphere, and other people will use their uh, sales, their sales assistants that know their Chinese consumers, know what they're looking for, and know the best way to communicate their brand DNA to their consumers. So every tool is about adapting that tool to reaching the consumer for the single brand. And brands, luckily, are masters at this, right? be it a luxury brand or a consumer brand, brands really are a master of using the media and tools that they have at their disposal to reach out to the right consumer. Now, um, in our sort of uh, calendar of uh, the uh, uh, Chinese shopping festivals, um, which do you think is the most important for the luxury brands and why? 
if we talk specifically about Alibaba, I think that one of the ones, obviously, that's the most important is 1111. And it's the most important one for everybody because it's such an exciting event that it's when we have the most people looking at what brands are doing. And since we've launched Luxury Pavilion, luxury brands do not discount for 1111. They have gift with purchase. They have exclusive products. So they're really giving an entertaining aspect, something new for people to look at. So there's just a lot of traffic and a lot of excitement. Um, but there are also the other um, festivals throughout the year, including, for example, Chinese New Year, which has always been big also in offline. So most brands do specific products for Chinese New Year. I like the uh, Chinese Valentine's Days because they get to have three. In particular, I like 520 because, you know, in Chinese it means I love you. And just the way that the brands play with that is really, really fun. Um, it's also great that there are different uh, festivals, so brands can choose which festival is most appropriate for their activities during the year. Um, and finally, um, is luxury back post-pandemic in China? Yes. Actually, I think that luxury, in a sense, never went away. We saw, of course, that as soon as people were able to go out, um, one of the first things that they did, we saw the lines outside of the luxury stores as soon as stores opened again in China. There are two things specifically about the luxury market worldwide right now. Um, we can't go out. We can't go to restaurants. We can't travel. This means that right now there's a lot of extra... Um, dollars available to be spent on luxury goods. The second thing specifically for China is because Chinese consumers are consuming at home in their local markets, they're consuming much more in China. It, traditionally, they would have consumed when they were traveling. Today, and for a while, probably for the next year, maybe two, they will still be consuming in China. So if anything, this local China market for consumption of luxury goods is getting stronger and stronger. Well, we could continue along for uh, a long while, but uh, you can read uh, more of uh, your insights uh, in the report. Um, but uh, for uh, the moment, uh, thank you very much indeed. It's been a, a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, and I um, uh, hope you have a good rest of the day. Thanks very much indeed Great. for joining us. Thank you. Well, uh, we talked a little bit about the fact that there were more than one uh, festival uh, of the year in China. Uh, let's now uh, take a look at all of the uh, festivals, uh, shopping festivals um, that uh, you can take advantage of uh, over the course of 365 days of the year. Well, I hope that gives you a feel for um, the, both the, the types, the numbers, the variety, uh, and probably more importantly, uh, who each of those festivals are primarily uh, aimed at. And in the report, um, we go into uh, a good amount of detail 
about each of those to give you a really good understanding of what those individual festivals are. Well, I'm very glad now to be, um, uh, to be able to introduce our um, second uh, guest speaker, which uh, is Natalie Romer, who's the uh, president uh, and CEO of um, Masson uh, Christophile uh, in live from Paris. Uh, Natalie, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure. Uh, Natalie, uh, Christopher was founded in Paris in 1830. Uh, you entered China in 1996, I believe. Um, it wasn't until, what, uh, a year and a half ago uh, that you entered China in a digital way. Why did it take you so long? Well, you should ask the people who were sitting at my place before. Um, but when I arrived here two and a half years ago, I immediately decided that this was the way to go. Um, it took us a bit of time because actually we are a startup in China, uh, even though we were established there uh, in the last century, I would say. Um, I have first had to recruit the right talents to deal with the right TP partner. And we actually went live on Alibaba and Luxury Pavillon last May. So it's not yet a full year of operations, um, but I'm uh, very satisfied with the results to date. And, and clearly it's the way to go when you're a small, I would say almost niche brand in China with a quite low awareness, um, small footprint, mostly focused on Shanghai. And uh, it really opens the door to reach many, many more luxury consumers across the country. Now, um, our report clearly shows the, the journey of China shopping festivals from being something which is primarily about uh, large discounts to uh, festivals that are full of uh, innovation and uh, new product development. Perhaps you can tell us a little bit about the innovations that you brought for the shopping festival and that sort of balance and relationship that clearly you have as a a, a brand owner, a business, uh, and also um, in the luxury sector of balancing uh, percentage discounts uh, uh, with the, the, the value of the product? Yeah, so, I, I mean, since we launched, um, we never did any discount. And I would like to say we won't. Um, and so far, we are very successful. I, I think it's, um, it's difficult to resist to the temptation. It's an easy way to boost sales in the short term, but our vision of China is we are there for the long run. So we want to establish our brand to build awareness and desirability as a luxury French uh, on, on these periods. Um, so we went on our first 11-11 with no promotion, at least no price discount. Now we played it with uh, a new product launch, which was our first pet accessories collection. Uh, we played it with access to the last numbers of our Farrell Williams and Jean Habert collaboration, because we have a few uh, numbers left of this limited edition. We played it with a gift with purchase. Um, we played it with a lucky draw. So we, we played with lots of tools, uh, but no price discount and it can work. Now, um, one of the features clearly of the uh, shopping festivals is that whole notion of uh, gamification. Um, as you say, uh, you played around with various different gamification type uh, of tools. How important is that um, to really engage the consumer and to help uh, you talk about the stories of the products? Well, I, I think Chinese consumers love, about, love ga gamification. Right, so it's important. Um, they also um, appreciate a lot exclusivity. So if you take the opportunity of a Chinese shopping festival, whichever it is, right, not only 11.11, to launch new products, maybe with a preview, maybe with a pre-order, um, uh, I, I think it's uh, drawing people to your brand. Um, then when it comes to impact of these festivals, I think, you know, looking back at 11.11, we had, of course, an amazing turnover compared to an average day. 
Um, but more importantly, we had just crazy traffic. And lots of people added to carts and decided to follow our page. And our job today is to reach out to them, right? And to nurture the relationship. Maybe they didn't buy the first time. Maybe because there was no promotion. But they might come back. Um, and, and so I think you really have to see this as a as a door opener to access a very large uh, audience across China, even where you have no physical presence with your stores. And then the job of the brand, and especially in luxury, is to nurture the relationship, to reach out to people, to propose things. And in the end, um, you will build loyal customers over time. But I think you make a very important point, which is uh, the role of the shopping festival, in a sense, is not just to be looked at through the sales that you make uh, in the shopping festival, but very much uh, how you use that festival in a strategic way to um, yeah. be able uh, to use the customers that you generate, the interest that you generate as the glide path for marketing activity during the course of the entire year. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Now, um, you have many artisans working for you, creating uh, very unique uh, designs. Some of those artisan skills really do go uh, back uh, down the cent centuries. Um, what connections do you think that there are now between the artisan skills in uh, China um, and your artisans? And do you see interesting sort of collaborations uh, between uh, the two uh, artisan skills uh, in the future? I, I do believe a lot in collaborations, um, but not colla collaborations for collaboration's sake, really collaboration with a common uh, vision, common values. And I think a good example is our uh, last uh, collaboration we launched in December 2020 with a Japanese artist, a lacquer master, uh, Mr. Junichi Akose. Um, and this is just, we are sold out, right? We, we, we need to reproduce. We only have eight numbers of each design, right? So it's a, a very scarce product. Uh, but this is really bringing the best craftsmanship of Japanese lacquer with the best craftsmanship of French silver silversmiths. And I'm convinced across China, there are many artisans and a lot of heritage. And of course, in the future, I would love to be able to launch some limited editions working together with these craftsmen. Now, what advice would you give to uh, brands who are uh, watching this thinking maybe now is the time uh, to do something uh, in China? What, ex what advice would you give them from uh, somebody well, the first who, one who's would done it? Stop, stop reflecting and waiting and go. <laughs> I mean, the time to do it is now, yeah? <laughs> yes. I mean, it's now, actually it was yesterday, right? So the, it's time to go. Um, the opportunity is there now, especially in the current global context. Um, the role of China and China digital sales um, is just gaining share worldwide. Uh, the Chinese tourists are out of Paris, out of New York, out of everywhere. Uh, so I would say go. Um, I would say be agile, test and learn. Um, I would say be true to yourself. Like don't um, lean towards the easy way, like price discounts or, you know, I, I've been approached for some liquidations on Tmall, etc. No, Tmall for us is our number one display window in China. And as such, it has to be from an execution standpoint for a luxury brand a perfect execution. Well, I, th I think that's interesting you saying that uh, for you, Tmall is, is, the, is, is the showroom to the entire uh, China. Yeah. I think everybody has a slightly different uh, perspective and usage of how they use Tmall. I think that's, uh, um, that's a really interesting uh, perspective of one of the great usages that you can have for it. Finally, I can't let you go by without asking you one very quick question, um, which is you spent 18 years at McKinsey, you ran their luxury practice Mm -hmm. um, what's the difference between uh, the consultant end of the table and the uh, CEO end of the table? Oh, you work more as a CEO? 
<laughs> Surely not. <laughs> not more than that. <laughs> um, no, I, I think the difference is um, the time perspective. You have a longer term perspective when you are CEO of a luxury house than when you are consulting, working on projects after projects. So you have to learn a bit about patience because things take time to happen in the real life. Um, I, I think a second big difference is actually, uh, I, I, and it's very personal, but I find it very satisfactory um, and fulfilling in terms of impact of what I'm doing every day because we are changing the course of a company with my team. Um, and uh, there is not a single day when I'm not going back home in the evening thinking, wow, we did this today, right? And I think it's different from uh, from being a consultant, even though I, I loved my job before and I love my job today. Amazon, Christophe, thank you very much indeed for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for the conversation. Well, we've talked uh, a lot about uh, the different types of festivals. We've seen them all. Um, laid out in front of us. Of course there's one Chinese festival that's uh, fast approaching and that is uh, Chinese New Year, the year of the ox and that starts, Spring Festival starts uh, next week and uh, Chinese New Year has traditionally for the last few years been the uh, uh, period where a number of brands including frankly a number of the luxury brands have created exclusive ranges just for Chinese New Year. So let's take a look at some of uh, the uh, ranges and products uh, that uh, some of the brands have launched for this Chinese New Year. Starts on uh, Tuesday, um, uh, the year of the ox. A very happy Chinese New Year to all of you. Now, um, we have uh, pulled together 11 insights, key insights uh, from our observations uh, from the uh, Dates with Destiny publication and report. Um, so let's take a look at uh, those key insights, the key things that you really must know. They might have been for singles to start with, but now they're for everyone. China's first commercial shopping festival was created just for single people and mainly for city dwellers in the top tier urban centers. Now, shopping festivals are for everyone in China with an internet connection, mainly a mobile one, wherever they may be. That's a market of around 700 million people. China's world-leading logistic services means that even shoppers in the most remote parts of the country can snap up festive deals and get super speedy delivery. In fact, 
some of the strongest category growth, including luxury, is coming from China's lower tier cities. They're not all about the discounts. Consumer excitement around never before seen discounts is what China's shopping festivals were built on. And there's no doubt that festival shoppers have come to expect outstanding value for money. Often that means products at half price, but there's more to value than a discount for consumers and fortunately for brands as well. Festivals have become less about dropping prices in order to shift old stock and more about launching new products, new releases, limited editions and fresh surprising brand collaborations. All these are now a huge part of the excitement around festivals for shoppers and have become a big part of what contributes to the consumer's sense of getting a great deal. They're too big to be ignored. Everything about these events is big. Big brands, big choice, big offers, big name celebrities and of course big sales figures. These events are new to the Chinese calendar but are already etched in the minds of consumers. A successful shopping festival can generate sales to sustain a brand through much of the rest of the year and form the basis of loyal relationships that pay dividends in the long term. There's shopping and then there's the festival. What people buy is only part of what gives them a thrill at festival time. In decades past, market days in a village were a celebration of togetherness, of shared excitement, of entertainment and shopping. That holds true today and while the headline sales figures just show how much shopping gets done, the festival element of these huge dates in the calendar are no less important and brands need to be part of that to succeed. In the digital age, tremendous excitement is created around festivals thanks to dazzling live concerts, games and game shows, often live streamed around the country, as well as online games that incentivize friends to play together for shared rewards. These events are highly interactive. Don't forget the shopping and the festival are two sides of the same coin. Planning must be perpetual. Success at a shopping festival is more about strategy than tactics, and brands need to take a long-term approach, both to planning and the way they measure results. It's easy to get caught up in the sales frenzy of these events, offering amazing promotions, but losing track of margins. Teamwork, technology and timing are key watchwords for brands. Festivals might be for Chinese consumers, but foreign brands can celebrate. At festival times, shoppers are on the lookout for two things. Something fresh and appealing from brands they already know and love, and something they've never tried before. International brands can win by fulfilling either or both of these needs. For those brands only just getting started in China, a festival is an opportunity to reach unmatched numbers of consumers from across the country who are highly engaged and are hoping to be pleasantly surprised. Your brand can deliver the serendipity shoppers seek. And in a post-Covid world, the appetite in China for international brands is particularly strong, especially in categories linked to health and well-being. data fueled creativity are your water and oxygen. If data is the oil of the digital age, then how it's refined is what determines the success of brands using e-commerce in China. Brands need to tap into all the data available to them, from their own proprietary systems and from the e-commerce platforms they partner with for shopping festivals. The brands that do best at festival time don't just hit the mark with their products. They create bold and compelling activities around them that add to the excitement and support their brand positioning. If data is what fuels success, then data-driven creativity is the ultimate catalyst. The events are huge, but brands don't have to be. The jockeying for consumer attention that goes ahead of a shopping festival in China is not for the faint-hearted. 
But it's not just the heavy hitters with massive marketing budgets that stand to do well. With the right support, even the smallest brands can make their mark and potentially their fortune at events like 1111 and 618. These sales platforms have product incubation tools and teams to guide first-timers in how to make the most of the festival opportunity. Chinese festivals have a reach beyond China. The international expansion of China's e-commerce brands means the festival spirit is also crossing new frontiers. Not only are shopping platforms taking festival structures into new markets, tailored for the habits and tastes of local consumers. Quick-thinking brands and retailers are also seeing opportunities to tap into the excitement around events like 1111 or even organize their own. China's festivals promise to change the world, yes, really. It's not just the key dates of China's shopping festivals that are starting to have an impact in other markets. It's that everything about them changes consumers' expectations, the broader business landscape, and even what's considered possible. Just as the arrival of Amazon in Western markets changed ideas of service, usability, and what constitutes quick delivery, these shopping festivals in China and all the infrastructure that supports them are doing the same thing, but on a much, much bigger scale. During the busiest part of the 1111 festival last year, Alibaba handled 544,000 orders per second. The technology that can handle that volume and the logistics and supply chain systems developed to manage orders are changing the entire business of retailing and promise to have spillover effect on other industries globally. Live streaming and KOLs should be high on brands' agendas. The big question regarding live streaming for brands in China is no longer do we, but rather when can we start? Just about everyone with an internet connection in China is engaged in live streaming, whether it's watching it, creating it, or a combination of the two. Live streaming is a powerful way of retaining consumers' attention long enough to explain product benefits and brand positioning. The endorsement of the right third-party live streamers lends a brand credibility and trust that helps a browser cross the line to become a buyer. But which key opinion leader to work with? Now that's a science in itself. Well, I hope that's given you a uh, clear perspective of uh, some of the key observations and insights that has come out of uh, our report. But there's uh, lots more treasure troves of insight in the report. And uh, in a moment, I will give you details about how you can uh, download them. Um, well, uh, I hope we are going to be joined by Sandy Verma, who is the Senior Vice President for Commercial uh, at uh, Allbirds. Uh, I seem to have uh, lost a little bit of Sandeep's feed, but uh, here he is, Sandeep. A very uh, warm welcome. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thanks for having me. Um, I know we had a couple of technical issues, so hopefully you can hear me okay. Uh, I can hear you and I can see you, so um, nobody's more um, grateful than me at the moment. Uh, Sandeep, thanks very much indeed for joining us. Um, all birds uh, are pretty much uh, a star uh, at the moment. Uh, you launched in uh, 2016. Uh, you entered the China market in 2019. Uh, what prompted a brand so young to make such an audacious move? Um, thank you for the kind words. Um, I'm not going to assume that any of your listeners uh, know know who we are and, and what we do. So just 20 seconds, if I may, or to, to introduce us. So our founding belief is that there's a better way to make stuff and that climate change is the problem of our generation. Um, but there's a consumer that's actually expecting that brands can make products, brands can make things that are, are better for them, but actually better for the world too. Um, and that was our founding belief. And if, if, we could, if we could take that compromise away, 
that's generally associated with environmentally friendly or sustainable products, that's a good thing. So that, that's what we're all about. We make products from, we make footwear primarily. We also make some apparel. I'm wearing a jumper from All Birds right now. Um, but our, our products are made from natural materials. We use materials like merino wool, which is EQ certified. Um, but ultimately, we're about having a lower carbon footprint through those natural materials. Um, and we've been around for just just under just under five years. Five years in 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 March. So now, given your, given your given your distinctive sort of uh, take uh, on life, um, again, um, why? Do you, did you think that uh, China would be a good place to uh, start so early on? And in particular, with the sort of story that you have uh, in terms of what drives the company and also what drives the way in which you make your products? Well, our, our ultimate purpose is to reduce environmental impact through better business. And that's a very, very lofty goal. And we all know that China has the largest consumer fashion um, segment in, in the world. So if we're going to truly try and have an impact on this problem, and this problem is way bigger than all birds, then China has to be involved in that. So we were very, very intentional about stepping into China. We, we went in 2019, as you say, uh, which was three years into us actually establishing. Um, we have a team now of 50 people on the ground in China um, and we're in we're in for the long game we think it's a, a crucially important market we think the APAC region overall is important but China particularly has a, has a big role and a positive role to play in in creating a better world uh, now um, you also used uh, one of the China shopping festivals 1111 as pretty much a spring board uh, to uh, create uh, both awareness to tell the story uh, and clearly to to sell products as well. Um, what what um, made you think that um, a very small brand like uh, Allbirds could have a share of voice uh, in such a crowded time period? Well, I think a couple of your um, the guests earlier have spoken really really well to the fact that you know Tmall and Alibaba are an incredible partner for us, but they're just such a big, big part of, of the China market. So um, it is a window to the world. It is an opportunity to engage consumers. And I think our take on that was leveraging the partnership that we've got with, with a partner that's very forward thinking to be able to tell our story. And we have a story to tell. Um, we think that there's a way to make products that are, are better for the world and, and, and better for people. And we also think that carbon, carbon emissions, is is the singular best scorecard. And actually, what we did is in 2020 we partnered with um, Tmall on Double Eleven specifically to tell that story. And instead of going for discounts, we recognised, as everyone knows, it's the biggest moment in the year. But actually, is there a slightly different way of engaging in that moment? with consumers when they're interested. And is there a slightly different story to tell? And yes, of course, consumers are looking for great value and there's tons of brands that are, are, are giving them that through price. That's not our gig. That's not what, what we stand for. We think you've got to be responsible with consumerism, but fundamentally it's about getting people out of products that are made from petrol and into products that are naturally produced with a lower carbon footprint. So we actually created an exclusive shoe for for Tmall, and in, we had a little play on words. So instead of double eleven D eleven, we called it D nine because our product was called the Dasher. It's the world's first uh, sustainable running shoe. That's a that's a nice um, alliteration. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And, and it just gave us the opportunity to tell a story and say, do you know what? It's an amazing moment to engage engage with us, but. There's, there's a bigger question that we want to provoke and, and maybe we should be asking questions of the, the brands that we're buying and, and, and the products that are produced and, and what kind of impact are they having. But at the same time, leveraging and, and giving uh, the consumers what they're expecting, which is value in that moment through an exclusive product with some good food purchase, but, but, but a different kind of story. And 
the results have been incredible for us. We're, we're very, very early into China, but our business in uh, 2020 is more than double what it did in uh, 2019. And I can tell you from the very early start that we've had in across January, it just continues to be a star in our portfolio. Now, uh, you have uh, a number of stores around the world, um, few in number, but probably great in impact. You have four stores uh, in China with a population of 1.4 billion consumers. So what is the role of the physical uh, retail outlet uh, in your China strategy and the combination of both the physical and the digital? Well, and that's... Unless my maths are very, very bad, we're not going to get very far with all stores if we're trying to use it for reach. Um, so it, it, it's about a bigger purpose. And, and, and look, the world is going through a, a huge change and a, a very difficult change. And clearly China has gone through that pandemic at, at, at a quicker pace. Um, but retail, our firm belief is, 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 has to be and will continue to be about experience. And we talk about try on experience um, as, as, as what we're trying to offer our consumers that take the time out of their busy life to come and visit us. And that's not only about physically trying on a shoe. I mean, most shoes um, that are purchased even today, maybe not so much in the last kind of six months. But if you take the last five, 10 years, 80 percent of footwear is bought in a store. So there's a very practical reason for people wanting to come into a store. But. Why we're in stores is not about that. It's not about reach, and it's not just about the, 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 the physical trying on the shoe. It's about the, about the fact that we are disrupting an industry <clears throat> which has been dominated for many, many years by uh, a wholesale model that requires discounting, it requires lots of products, it requires products that are made from petrol that are synthetic, and churning a lot of these products out over and over again. We don't do that. We don't use those materials. And therefore, when you have a consumer presented with a shoe that's made from wool or a shoe that's made from eucalyptus fibers, they're curious. Why have you done that? What's that going to be like? Is it really the world's most comfortable shoe? As, as, as Time Magazine called us very early into our journey. So it gives consumers the opportunity for a brand like ours to come and experience the product, but at the same time get deeply, deeply engaged in the story. And we have, we're very lucky to have incredible, incredible people around the world, whether it's in China, whether it's in Japan, whether it's in the US, Europe, New Zealand, that care deeply about our brand and our purpose, and they want to tell the story. So they get to do that whilst physically explaining what our products are all about. And we think that experience is, is important. So that's the role of retail for us. We are going to continue to invest in it. We are opening more stores globally. And we will, in the future, open more stores in China. Now, um, you're a company and a brand that's uh, growing immensely quickly um, at an exponential rate. Um, what learnings are you picking out up from the Chinese shopping festivals in China in general? Uh, that you think uh, are applicable uh, across the world and that's also helping you to grow your business across the world? Fantastic question. Look, I, I'm relatively new to, to, to operating within China. Um, we have a very experienced team, but I, I was very lucky to spend nearly three months um, of my time personally living in Shanghai and visiting Chengdu and Guangzhou and Beijing and, and really spending a lot of time with with our team and with our consumers. And I think what struck me the most is just the pace, the pace and the intensity in a good way of the options that the consumer has. The world moves very, very quickly in China and for any brand, no matter what your model, whether you're vertically integrated, whether you're a wholesaler, whether you're in a particular sector, any brand is gonna be as good as how well they listen to their consumer and they do things that are, are, are right for their brand and right for their consumer. And I think what we've really learned from, from, from China is just the immense potential the market has and the opportunity for us to react very, very quickly to the insights that we get, whether it's from the store, 
whether it's from what we do in team or whether it's from just talking to consumers. Um, and I do think this, this idea of bringing together great products with a fantastic story and brought together to the consumer with an incredible amount of care has to be the way that, that, that brands will, will, will find success. And it's certainly been um, a contributor, a big contributor to, to any success that we've been lucky enough to have so far. Well, um, finally, I can't help but ask you a product-related question, uh, and that is uh, your uh, newish range um, that uh, um, is good for wet weather. Um, are they really good for wet weather? They are. They are. You're, t you're, you're talking about the Mizzle range. This is very, very close to my heart. I have a um, yeah. This particular product um, was born just going back to the role of retail. When I, I was lucky enough to launch our operations into Europe, so I was the first hire into Europe and spent the first few weeks of my time once we opened in Covent Garden in London working in the store. And what we were hearing from consumers is, what are these things like in the rain? I mean, we're Brits, right? You're a Brit. We love the weather, we love talking about the weather, we love thinking about the weather. And we were able to take that insight and, and actually do something with it relatively quickly. And that product that we developed, the Mizzle, which is um, probably, I'm not sure whether I can claim it's the world's first, but probably the world's first um, water repellent, fluorine free, sustainable shoe. That product is now over 50% of our, of our business in Europe. And it just goes to show when you're focused on the consumer and you're able to listen and do something about the insights, good things will come. Well, your um, afternoon hasn't been completely wasted. You've convinced me, so I shall add that to my collection of all birds uh, a, a bit later on. I'll post a, I'll, I'll, I'll post a picture of them uh, on the site. Um, uh, Sandeep, um, it's been an absolute pleasure and a delight. We could carry on for a long time, but sadly, and we run out of time, but Sandy Verma, the Senior Vice President uh, for Commercial at Allbirds, uh, thank you very much indeed for talking with us. It's, uh, it's been a pleasure and uh, highly uh, illuminative. Thanks for having me. Pleasure. Thank you. Well, we've almost come to the end of uh, this uh, webcast. Um, thank you very much indeed for uh, joining us. I know we've had a few technical uh, issues along the way, but we'll be posting a uh, entire version of this uh, on uh, the website, and we'll give you the details uh, of that in case you've uh, missed uh, any elements of it. Of course, uh, a project like this can't be done uh, by one or two people alone. I'd very much like to thank uh, all the team uh, at uh, Alibaba for their help and the support uh, on the insights um, and uh, also Jo Bowman for uh, her help and support uh, on uh, the writing of the report. So all the really good bits um, that, uh, that you enjoy are probably written by Jo. The average ones are probably written by me. Um, but thank you very much indeed, Jo. Um, also to uh, Tuin uh, Das Gut, uh, who uh, produced um, all of our videos and to our team uh, at uh, WPP and especially to uh, uh, the uh, uh, communications team, uh, Pema at uh, Alibaba. Uh, thank you very much indeed uh, for watching. Um, I'm just going to leave you uh, with the details, the URL of where you need to go to in order to download uh, the copy uh, of the report. It's available for you uh, now, as I say, uh, in advance of it being made available uh, to anybody else. Uh, enjoy it. Um, I'm very happy to answer any questions that you have uh, on it and around it and I hope that it inspires you uh, to uh, look at uh, not just 11.11 but every single Chinese shopping festival as uh, an opportunity to grow your brand, to grow your business uh, and uh, to take advantage of the uh, growth and consumer uh, growth that we are seeing at the moment in China. So from me David Roth, uh, thank you very much indeed for joining, especially thank you to um, all of our guests uh, in uh, today's broadcast and uh, also uh, for those uh, watching uh, in China uh, and who celebrate uh, Chinese New Year around the world, a very happy uh, and healthy uh, Year of the Ox. Thanks very much indeed.